Welcome back, everybody. This is week number two, but match number one of the Arc Light League. And I, Mansa, am joined by the just ever so masterful when it comes to Dory knowledge, which is key for today, by the way. Josh Lau, how you doing? I'm doing well, Ethan. Uh, I'm really, really hyped for this match, and I'm I'm hyped to cast this match in particular with you. Because this is kind of, you know, the most on-brand, on-point, uh, flavorful matchup and casting duo that you're going to get. I, I know, think. we should be we should be fighting. I'm about to throw punches Yeah, we, we should be this. fighting, but, uh, you know, I guess we'll, we'll, we, both, we both have our champions in this game. And we'll see <laughs> how they do. Right, because the matchup today is, A, it's Leviah versus Dorinthia, and it's my yeah. teammate as well, Lucas Oswald. Piloting the Leviah versus mm -hmm. uh, Team Ascent's Easton Douglas on the yeah. Dorinthia. And so, my brother is on Team Ascent, so I guess he's yeah, very on brand here. <laughs> that's a, that gets you a right hook right there. Yeah, there you, uh, there you go. But it's really cool to see these players uh, just meet in week two right here. I, I believe both players were 1 0 as well. Uh, Lucas Oswell got a buy in week got zero or oh, week I one, see. sorry. And uh, Easton uh, unfortunately lost his match uh, last week. Uh, he was piloting. Decimator Dory, so we're gonna have to see if he's uh taking Decimator Dory or he's gonna flip Dawn Blade or, or maybe hatchets or something. We'll we'll have to see. Spicy. So a bit of a pare down situation, but none uh nonetheless, it is wildly exciting. So let's go ahead yeah. and take a look at the okay. game. Sweet. So here we see Easton Douglas on the bottom half of the screen piloting. Look at that, it is Dawn Blade and then Lucas Oswald. Game face on hair tousled already. On Leviah, starting with my God, a shadow of Lazfit that actually hits. <laughs> That's pretty good. Um, so, just you, 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 you alluded to it that this is a Dawnblade Dory, uh, which th this is going to be potentially a very, very, very quick match. Um, Dawnblade Dory can be very, very explosive at times. Of course, though, Leviah has quite a bit of armor, so that's something that we're going to need to look out for. Of note, it looks like Leviah is uh, rocking the Gambler's Gloves and not the uh, Apex Bonebreaker. Right, yeah, um, that's actually pretty yeah. interesting to see off the bat. Uh, obviously, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the new cards from Heavy Hitters were legal, but it might be a situation where Lucas expecting Easton to perhaps be on that Decimator Great Axe list that you mentioned he was on last week. A little bit of a hedge towards mm -hmm. facing this more fatigue-oriented Dory you do want to take more opportunities to go above this like 12 power turn and therefore gamblers letting you roll more, having more uh, redundancy into like rolling ones, right? That is mm -hmm. very, very potent. So makes a little sense, makes a little sense. But because it is Dawnblade, the other pieces of equipment are still looking quite strong. Flesh bag, absolutely yep. incredible. And you can't discount the husk. But in yep. front of us right now is one of the tricks that Dory has up our sleeve, which can literally be almost any card in the deck, right? Singing Steel Blade. Yeah, yeah. Singing Steel Blade going to grab the new card Agile Engagement, one of the best uh, new attack reactions from heavy hitters. Uh, because Hungering Slaughter Beast is an attack action, that's going to grant uh, Easton a agility token that he can use next turn. And it looks like because the first attack hit, he's going to continue the attack here. And with the Brave Forge Bracers, going to come. Josh, I think I lost you. Josh. I think the very, Hold very on. important thing to wait. talk about is how Scowling Fleshback actually changes how you play Dorinthia. So wait, normally, wait a second. Hold uh, up, Josh. you place Josh. your threat into the arsenal, and you wait for a hand with a blue and a pump, and then you go. However, because of Scowling Fleshback, you have to put your pump in the arsenal instead and start off with your threat. So that means uh, the, the hands that are optimal for Dory are actually a little bit less. So when she sees them, she's going to have to go, and she just isn't going to have much choice in whether or not she goes. Okay, wait, hold up. Do you hear me now, Josh? Yes, I do. You, yes. like, hella lagged out like robot uh, level oh. for, for a long bit there. So I paused the video on my oh, end. Okay. Uh, so we can... Uh, I'll just let Vishra know in editing, and we can pick right sure. back up. Uh, the last oh. thing you had said was uh, fetching, like, the agile engagement was, was basically okay, let, let it. Me, let me... Let me see. See if okay. I, I I don't know why I would have lagged, but I'll just shut down Steam just in case. I guess. Okay. Uh, are you, what what timer are you are you at? Uh, it is at two minutes and nine seconds. It's right after that. Okay. That okay. Second so we'll Dawnblade just... had passed. Okay. It's now Lucas passing okay. back into Easton. Okay. 
Do you want to just restart the cast, or do you want to just cast from here? Oh, we can just cast from here. I I like the okay. intro. I I can just pick okay. up on saying something. Okay. Uh, so two oh nine. You want to unpause in like three yep, seconds. Two oh nine. Three. Okay. Two. One. Yeah. So notably on that block, even though Lucas has gone ahead and just kind of laid the whole hand down, passing it right back into Easton, you do have to note that Deep Rooted Evil is banished turn zero, and then Hal from mm -hmm. Beyond was blocked with on that turn one out of Lucas. So even though it's a slow start in terms of damage presented from Lucas, he's got all these pieces in play now with the recursion already half of where he wants it to be, the other half mm -hmm. being in the graveyard. It's something that, you know, value wise can just accrue crazy, crazy numbers. The question is going to be, can he get there? Because this is a Dawnblade Dory that is starting off incredibly strong with a now Yellow's Warrior Valor, which I know you love that card, into Blade yeah, Flurry. That's a good card. <laughs> yes. I, uh, Lucas is playing with fire here, and, uh, not not blocking when <laughs> there's a counter on Dawnblade. Uh, I guess he might have been afraid of the agility token granting unconditional go again there. Um, several blowouts could happen uh, if, you, if you block too much there. Uh, looks like Endless Maw here from uh, Lucas going to come mm -hmm. back across. Going to banish a couple cards as well. Uh, unfortunately, we can't really see if he banished the, the Howl. Um, that would be a, a good card to have uh, in the banish zone there. Right. That's that's really what you're checking for. Because apart from Deep Rooted Evil really being unlocked on like Dread Screamer mm -hmm. hands, Art of War hands, Hell from, mm -hmm. Beyond, Hell from Beyond specifically is the card that doesn't care about pulling in extra action points. Uh, you know, you find the right cost curve. You just slam three damage out of nowhere on even like a two card hand with blue and boneyard start to pull these extra two card nines out of the deck it just looks freaking yep. fantastic but we see pretty clean uh you know three value block on something like iron song response red there that could have prevent that could have presented three in return what does that really tell you from easton side this is this is ah uh, this is if if you I'm sorry. Can you repeat the question? I was thinking about something. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> related yeah, it, to the carried house. Sure, there, sure. I, I, thought, I saw an opportunity there for the carried house to block there, but <laughs> when you, when sorry. you block with iron song response, red mm -hmm. in that kind of situation, yes. right? That is yep. just a clean three value on the block, obviously, mm -hmm. but it also, because of the reprise could be three on the dawn blade. And of course, presenting yeah. more on hits and all that. So we saw Easton mm -hmm. just no, yeah. kind of show his hand mm -hmm. in a situation where I feel like a lot of Dorinthia players will keep all these extra cards uh, to, to mind yeah. game their opponent. He cleanly put the three down. And yeah. what did that really tell you about the turn? That that, that was uh, most likely because of the Karen Husk there, or he was afraid of the Scowling Fleshbag. Right. Um, I, I think Easton is going to play these first couple turns of the game, kind of poking at, at Lucas, trying to see how he reacts to different attack patterns. And we saw that Lucas seems to be holding his armor, like just keeping it back. He hasn't deployed any of it to make a move here. Um, playing a little bit more mid rangey than, um, than I think maybe Easton was expecting there. Right. And we see, I'm actually just so surprised from Easton, the blocks on his mm -hmm. end, just not letting these good rate turns from Lucas really land, right? Like we see a three card, 12 play Dread Screamer into Slithering, this beautiful three cards for 12 damage, pretty above rate compared to what Dorinthia is doing. Easton saying, yep. I'm not taking the bait with your armor up. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to block yep. it and make my hands smaller, make you answer, uh, you know, mm -hmm. less play around like what this one extra card in Arsenal really could be as of now. Mm -hmm. This game is actually very different than I anticipated it going. Um, Lucas is already at 10 blood. There's just so much blood debt here on the other side. He, maybe he's waiting for, or, for wait, wait, Josh, do you uh, hear me? Lucas to draw a hand that can't turn off blood debt, or maybe, or I'm not exactly sure what he's. Wait, do you hear me, Josh? Hello. In front of the endless maw, Steelblade Supremacy is a pretty good card, but. Uh, Veteran Dorinthia players know that you generally can't play that when they still have armor up, and it's extremely risky to try to uh, go for a. Oh no, Josh. <clears throat> uh oh, Josh, you uh -oh. hear me? 
yeah, it roboted out for a while and then the the call even dropped. Uh so yeah. I have it uh mm-hmm. I took note of where things were. I paused at 5:45 and the first thing or the last thing you said was he is at 10 blood debt and then yes. it froze. <laughs> oh, okay. So I have it paused at 5:45. Uh, so so maybe you don't need to stream the game to me maybe that will help because i'm uh, not watching it right now yeah that's that's but true i guess i don't probably need to on my end like the internet issues is probably on my end but uh, uh maybe maybe because you're uploading that that might have effect oh. hold up so okay i just changed the region so in obs or not obs in discord you can choose which server you're on so okay. i just ch- changed it to us east rather than ah, yeah 50 ms right now yeah yeah rather than automatic because maybe that'll just lock it in if you also change it to us okay. east uh is that under user settings or is that under like, it should right be above, like video top, connected it should be like top right of the call screen there's a region uh oh i see yeah mine's on us east right now oh okay well then maybe oh. maybe mine was i don't know the issue then but i just locked it to us east yeah um rip hmm. all right i mean oh. i can also just turn off i can also just turn off the uh yeah i think i think you could thing. just turn off that and then yeah i, I mean i'm still recording you so okay you know, stay cool. in that way um we okay. can cue us back up i'm at 5 45 okay. in the video okay. yep and yep. uh the last thing you said was lucas is at 10 blood debt yep. so i can okay. hit play in three and okay. then you can take off from that point three yep. two one so I, I, it's like turn five or six now, maybe turn seven, and Lucas is already at ten blood debt. Um, is is that a little bit above average? Uh, is he? It looks like he's racing towards thirteen yeah. blood debt as quickly as possible, right? Yeah, that's actually interesting to point out. It is a lot of blood debt for how early in the game it is. I think if we if we saw the turn counter, we're probably on like turn six or so, mm-hmm. and Lucas took yep. that first turn to block out, right? Just mm-hmm. pretty cleanly. Well, I guess even on turn zero, he he sent one blood debt his way at the Shadow Blasphet. But ever since yep. that first turn of blocking out, it's been banish three, banish three, banish three. And, you know, hitting this kind of blood debt, 13 cares really only about redeemed if you're trying to flip to, to that sort of hero, which of course has baked in eight life. So <laughs> racing to 13 yep. is not something you like necessarily do. It's mm-hmm. more so about can you flip to 13 life, which is not something actually tied to the, the blood debt count itself, but something that the Dorinthia player can watch for inversely is, well, if you do flip at 13 and you do have this monster pile of blood debt, the fact that a warrior's cards block three so well, you can likely fatigue with blocking 12 plus armor pretty cleanly. Yeah, I, and Lucas looks like he he just presented a little bit over 60 cards as well, so there's definitely the threat there. And, you know, seeing... Eastern block with cards like Steelblade Supremacy might be an indication that like he wants to play a little bit more defensively. Obviously, Steelblade Supremacy does have a lot of issues into decks with very high amounts of armor, so that also could be uh, Easton playing very, very patiently here. Um, in terms of key cards, I think Easton is probably waiting for a Blade Flurry um, or a Puncture, if I had to guess, for his... Uh, offense mm-hmm. look a hold the line from the arsenal here wow yeah so huh. that that speaks a lot to easton's approach on the matchup maybe he baited yeah. a little bit of aggression early with mm-hmm. lucas right like we are going to yeah. play the dawnblade game but actually he yeah. falls back on a bit more yeah. of this fatigue strategy yeah. especially with the graveyard uh running so light as you flip to just full blockout cycles if there hasn't been a lot of proactivity from early art of wars early blood rushes that graveyard can be quite a problem but you know i guess easton can flip it right back on lucas here if he's not presented with too much damage to worry about and that's what we see with uh, a lead with speed setting up this agility for not only a pretty decent turn initially but even on the follow-up if lucas doesn't present that much here it's going to be pretty scary yeah, one one of the interesting things about Dorinthia is that you can pivot in the middle of the game depending on how things are going. And I know Easton has um, either written about or, or I, he talked about in a podcast or something the idea of faking aggression as Dorinthia mm-hmm. just to get them to block with some cards and then pivot and try to fatigue them. And 
that might be what he's going for here because we haven't seen him make or attempt a very, very big play here. We haven't seen him hold a five card hand. Um, so the, mm -hmm. I, I really think Easton might be, uh, might be looking at trying to do that here. Right. Right. And what smart play as well to find these windows to be aggressive because some of the cards that Dorinthia can play now, like the mm -hmm. commanding performance, when you do flip that switch and have like one aggro turn cycle, it's not mm -hmm. just damage. It's now some disruption tied to this Dawnblade plus one. So we, we see Lucas even undoing for a second because that commanding performance, quite the bait. I mean, clearly you want to just block a Dawnblade from getting plus one counter, even in this kind of fatigue state, because you don't want to give the Dory too much room to take the game away. But you're going to lose your arsenal if you want to block. Yeah, that's and and I think brute players in general keep very 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 high priority targets in their oh, yeah. arsenal to set up you know four or five card hands because their their hands do scale exponentially. Um, so I think Lucas has got to debate real real hard here on whether or not to give a Dombly counter here, mm -hmm. and he's going to block here and decides to lose his arsenal. Yeah, and, yeah, that uh, Arsenal was a yeah. Mark of the Beast, which luckily it wasn't one of those power cards like a, you know, a Blood Rush, an Art of War, that type of thing would have been absolutely devastating to lose. But it's also yeah. a tough spot because the card he blocked with was a Ghostly Visit, and that's the kind of card that from hand means nothing. Mm -hmm. That card gets yeah. its good rate when you are playing mm -hmm. it out of the Banish Zone, and it's even fine on blocking because it's baseline three. So very tough spot. You wanted to make the ghostly look good because it definitely doesn't look good coming from hand, but he had to give up the Mark of the Beast in Arsenal to do it. And uh, it all led into this Scab's turn, which I'm not even sure yeah. why it was a Scab's turn, honestly. That's a two card nine <laughs> right there. What are you rolling for? A claw? Madman. I, Madman. I, I, guess, I guess that is what he's rolling for here at 15 blood dead as well. It's... Oh, okay. He's rolling oh, for something dude. a little better than that. Oh, wow. That's not okay. a claw. That is the one card six, Blasma Fett, which is normally something wow. that, well, versus Dorinthia, if they've kind of had, like, if, if they've struggled within the game, like trying to gain counters and all that, you do give them a pretty prime target to build their first counter in Blasma Fett, but if there's all this momentum on your side, you don't really worry about that aspect of it. You just look to play it in situations like this because a one card six that sticks six life on the board, I mean, that's still just nuts. Yeah, but this, it, depending on Easton's hand, he may have to break bolters here to get the Blasma Fett off the board here. Uh, he, <laughs> I, I'm curious to see how he, he decides to approach this. It seems like Easton has been focusing on kind of small ball offense, you mm -hmm. know, two, three card hands here. He may not have a go again here, and okay, looks like yeah, clean kill target here. Okay, clean yeah, kill here. Mm -hmm. Stroke of foresight here, gonna come into play here. The grain's also gonna generate a vigor token, which is quite nice. Um, okay, so he took care of that, but uh, looks like Levi's gonna strike back with an art of war turn here. Right. Yeah. So, this is this is the the good yeah. kind of draw sequence. Once you've established mm -hmm. Blasmfet, if the next hand you draw up, especially if it's not aided by mm -hmm. a power card in Arsenal, if that next hand is quite weak, then you mm -hmm. don't do much with this extra six life that you've bought because some of Levi's hands really do want to block down inherently anyway. So this is yep. quite nice uh, draw sequence wise. This looks really good for Lucas, and yep. we have to remember that the art of war is pretty much always live in sending 12 damage because there's the deep rooted evil that's in that banish zone as well. So yep. one other attack coming through plus a resource card is going to convert to easily 12 damage presented here, which is getting to be quite a bit of Easton's life. Not going to be lethal, but he's at yep. 17 in a, a game state that we thought maybe he was taking closer to fatigue where I just don't think that's going to be possible anymore. Yeah. I, I, Lucas still has over half his deck left and I, I mean, this hold the line here is going to come into play here. I think the Art of War was to draw cards, right? It it so was. That... I don't think we saw that it prevented yeah. three, but in the life it did. He went from 17 okay. to 16, yeah. Yep. So hold the line here, becoming quite the tech card, uh, you know, mainly played against Blood Rush Bellow, Art of War users, Tome of the Imperial Flame. Um, looks like some decks, ex warrior decks can bake blue uh, tech after Glimp the Quicksilver, uh, our blue quality falls off a cliff. <laughs> so, <laughs> like, Brute has a uh, record romp, right? And then uh, it's a little bit rough after record romp. Hey, right? all the more <laughs> reason to play Olympia. That way, up the ante can at least be a blue you're quite proud of, right? All right. Looks like... Are you there? Oh. Let me pause. Uh -oh. I uh -oh. do hear you. 
Wait. Uh oh. <laughs> I, wait. Do you hear me? Yeah, I, I, I hear you. Yes, yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, I've been I've been yeah. hearing you this whole time. It didn't. Oh, okay. It didn't pause on my okay. end. I, okay. Okay. Uh oh. Uh, did I did get robotic? Back then? No, you didn't. I I just uh, didn't hear you for like. 20, 30 seconds, so I wasn't sure what was going on. Oh, then maybe I did lie, because I, I mentioned up the ante as a good blue. Did you oh, I didn't that? I didn't hear any. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I didn't hear that at all. Oh. I said, uh, our blues fall off a cliff, and then something about record romp. Oh, well, actually, it yeah. landed well, because you didn't say anything in the gap that I said up the ante. So I, I don't I don't think it actually oh. ended up too bad in the, <laughs> the final edit here. But oh, okay. we can we can resume um, Okay. here. Let's go yeah. back to 13... Uh, let's go to like 13, uh, like 37. That's like basically when you came back, okay. I think. Sure. 1337. Okay. Okay. Yep. Wait, what was the last thing we mentioned though? If, if that uh, wasn't I, real. Oh, I, I, I said that, uh, Warriors can bake blues into their en- or tech blues into their energy base. Okay, I'll I'll just uh, mention because, like a Leviah yeah. blue base thing then, then yeah, we can sure. close that loop. Yeah, go go for it. Okay, thirteen okay. thirty seven. Yep. Three, two, one. Yeah, it's actually so interesting the the blues across classes like that because Leviah, as you pitch these blues, we've actually seen it a little bit. Tear Limverlim is a power card that. Lucas just pitched next to a swing big, which is like kind of the ceiling of what that blue can do anyway. So the, the blues that Lucas is natively pitching in with tear limb convulsions, barraging, all of them just help end the game so easily. And when you're at 17 blood debt, if you do go for the flip, not saying you do, but if you do, then you so quickly get to that blue base and we might see something like that tear limb from limb into a swing big for 16 sooner than you think but what is happening right now to be fair is blood rush bellow first of the game let's yep. see if it first actually one. lines up but a red pitch yep. doesn't seem to be yeah, how that, we just that, want to start that's, that. that's 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 not how you want to start your blood rush bellow turns looks like he pitched two cards for that yeah okay Did no so pick? he that's a second blood rush bellow actually the first oh, one was blood red pitch okay. second one now uh-huh. blue dread screamer so i mean if he's got playables to go with this how can you shrug it yeah. off it might have started poorly but you've drawn so many cards with this double blood rush perhaps it yep. still oh. threatens lethal yeah we we saw a lot of the armor there get exchanged there and we're quickly heading into late game here uh this this is a very very tough spot because easton doesn't have tempo and he's gonna be at probably a 12 life deficit when this is all done at least Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe even greater. Uh, he, he still has access to some armor here, but uh, th- this is uh, this is going to be a very tricky, tricky spot to pilot himself out of. Right, and it's it can feel pretty smothering to play against the Levi in this kind of position mm-hmm. because the Levi yeah. just had a fantastic turn. Is now points above you. Is continuously doing above rate things by her nature, and then can also fall back on a demi hero. I mean, how yep. do you overcome? that kind of valley deficit. Like, is there actually anything in Dory that can do it, Josh? No, not really. And uh, <laughs> this is, this is going to take a huge chunk of his life here. This, this thing has dominate, right? So this, oh, yeah. we've got to see the armor deployed here. Uh, maybe an, oh, another hold the okay, line here. Hold the, oh, line. Oh, hold the line there. Do <laughs> literally doing what it's supposed to do. <laughs> hold, hold uh, the line. Hold, yep. It's, <laughs> it's holding there. And I mean, this is kind of the way you have to play it. You just have to chip back. Maybe what one of the ways that Dory can kind of get back in the game is with grains of blood spill, kind of cycling a vigor token. One one of the great things is that Dory, like baseline with grains, can get fifteen value out of her hand. She mm-hmm. can full block and then use the vigor token to swing Dawn Blade, and then maybe the next turn block with three cards and then attack and then generate another vigor token. Kind of repeat that. That could close the life deficit here, but. You know, cards like Graveling Growl here is going to go a little bit wide this turn, and uh, right. Well, it's back to probably going to. Yeah, yeah, it's an Art of War turn too, with Howl yeah, on a, top of it. Of this War. is this is no mere one for six. This turn is yeah. probably looking okay. I mean, at minimum, the deeper evil should be playable, right? But it actually is just another Graveling Growl for nine. So, 
Yeah, this turn, once again, demanding cards because we're in that lethal range for the Dory. And we saw a Reckless Swing being pitched here, so Easton knows he has to stay out of that Reckless Swing range, and he's already within double Reckless Swing range. Mm -hmm. So I think Lucas should have this game roughly... <laughs> Right, uh, right. It, it, we don't want to call it just based on yeah. like a double reckless kill because Leviathan mm -hmm. still has to navigate blood debt. Yes, but correct. writhing like beast Ryan. hulk, yep. writhing beast mm -hmm. hulk is a difference in terms of guaranteeing like this quote unquote like true damage lands because mm -hmm. it, it it has dominate as well. And when you have Terra Limb from Lim in the list, which we've seen at least yep. two pitch from Lucas, you mm -hmm. can set up a twelve damage dominate writhing. So from yeah. that at least. Easton would be dead, <laughs> but but yep. do we see? Well, we have Art of War into a Blood Rush Bellow <laughs> oh, here. Oh <laughs> my goodness! Oh my goodness! Haymaker after and, Haymaker. Uh, yeah, th this this turn could get very very crazy here. Uh, looks like we're gonna have Claw Claw and still have two cards here. So five and two uh, into something here. Yeah, the craziest part oh. about this is if somehow this didn't line up into attack after the Mandible Claw, which would have to be some like rare edge case of well yep. even blues pay into the deeper evil since he played mm -hmm. the art of war um yeah. but uh you don't even like lose you just flip and say okay i mill my yep. deck but like you're at two so i'll just win next turn anyway yep. crazy good spot to be in yep and i, th I think the game's about to end oh here. sure but how is it gonna end it looks like it's gonna be a beast within here oh and Beast within, like that. <laughs> staring him down, staring him down with that dirty yep. eyeball for the win right there. Uh, and that's it. That takes yeah. <laughs> us to the end of Leviah versus Dory in a finish that, you know, from some of the early reads of the game where Lucas is launching into blood debt so quickly, his graveyard so light, you know, could Easton pull off this fatigue strategy? We kind of just saw Leviah do Leviah. Things yeah, and that, hit Art that of Wars was and doing Leviathan things. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Art of Wars, Blood Rush Bellows. We even got to see a blast effect there. So you Sick. know, with a scabs sure roll, that... with a scabs roll. Heck yeah, yeah not a yeah. one. Yep, yeah, not a one. You know, he did have the gambling gloves as well as uh, insurance, but uh, he didn't even need to use it. So that's no, nope, that's good. just a super solid yeah. win across the board for not only Lucas, who actually is a. Welcome back, everybody, to the Arclight League. I am DM Armada, and I'm joined by Taylor Crawford. Taylor, how's it going? Going great. How about you, man? I am looking forward to watching these games. We have two games for you today, and both are just absolutely spicy. The first one that we're going to jump into is Majin Bay on Teklavasan versus Alex Vor on Fi. It's not the traditional matchup that you might think of when you think of you know, five versus a mechanologist. And so we're going to be in for a little bit of a treat here. What are your takes on this matchup, Taylor? Well, it's all going to depend on the first two or three turns for the Teklo Vossen, uh, assembling the uh, mechanoid as fast quickly as he can. Uh, if not, the five will probably run away with the game just from uh, going to chain link seven every turn. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be a long chain link and a lot of perhaps defending for the tech low. But let's go ahead and jump down into it and see how this begins and unfolds. So as you can see, we're going to be watching from the perspective of Teklavasan and Majin Bey as he's deciding on how he wants to uh, sort of sideboard in this matchup. And as you might expect, the uh, the more popular and I guess more uh, splashy version of this Teklavasan deck has really been more of a mid-range deck that runs a lot of these uh, base pieces of equipment that you can then stack those evos on. And as you see, right off the bat, we draw into one of those Steel Soul evos that we can kind of slam down, depending on the resources we have at our disposal. 
Yeah, one of the more important things to notice there is he has protos in the sideboard. So if it does get blown up somehow, uh, he does have the fabricate to bring it back. Yeah, it looks like Which we are going. Later. It definitely does. Yeah, and uh, here we're going to start with the uh, Evo Steel Soul processor. Going to be just playing that out for the resources. In, in this way, we could activate the Teclavasan effect, play it at instant speed, and draw a card. But in doing so, it looks like we would just kind of be consigned to putting whatever we drew into the uh, arsenal. And in this case, we actually end up with that Terminator tank there. Yeah, uh, looking at this hand, it looks like a four-three blocks to me. <laughs> It's not not too bad. The uh, Steel Street Enforcement's going to be a little bit slow going because we only have one Evo online, but we are just going to try and block efficiently from Majin's side. And uh, over there on uh, Alex's side, he is throwing Haymaker after Haymaker, as you would expect Phi to do. Yeah, yeah. Coming uh, across with the uh, chain link four. Yeah, lava vein loyalty, full blocks across the board. And I do want to point out, uh, if we're looking at equipment loadouts on the side of Alex, you do have to keep in mind that uh, mask of the pouncing links because at any point he can choose whenever one of his attacks hits to go pop that and go fetch one of those large attacks. And well, we could see him go grab something you know very simple and basic uh, like a lava burst. Or now he has access to the brand new card Tenacity from this most recent heavy hitter set. Yeah, and that's a great card uh, into Teclavasan, Guardians, or anything defending a lot. Uh, Usuri's pretty solid into it, too. Yeah, definitely one of those uh, considerations if uh, Teclavasan does go and block with a bunch of equipment and uh, then follow up with blocks from hand. But here, uh, just going to send the two damage now that our leveler is online from the one steel soul piece we have equipped. Oh, yeah. Looks like he's got Scrap Trader, but I don't believe he's blocked with any Evos this turn, so it's just going to be a two block more than likely. <laughs> the classic zero attack Phoenix Flame. Sometimes you just have to have that chain starter, and you unfortunately end up having to make it a, the uh, the Phoenix Flame that you grab from Graveyard. Oh, yeah. Uh, but Looking at this. Uh, well, yeah. the good thing about like having uh, these two blocks into the four attacks is that without Mask of Momentum, he doesn't, he's not even thinking about that, thank the Lord. Yep. And it does enable a pretty powerful follow-up in a four attack go again into a three attack sword. Oh yeah. Pushing to the end of the turn, they're feeling pretty comfortable in uh, not worrying about those uh, final attacks as we see that there's a lot of uh, a lot of blues in pitch and that's not something that you necessarily want to see from Fi. No art of war type turn, so it gives us the capacity to maybe double pitch and send the CNC as we see uh, Majin Bay doing. Yeah, just threatening cards out of hand here is really important for Teclo Vossen, uh to get ramped up, finding those Evos as quickly as possible. And from the Teclo Vossen perspective, what is your take on uh, his strategy throughout this early game and uh, into that mid game? Uh, if he can maintain life totals within 10 uh, till mid to late game, uh, he'll be feeling really well. And if he can assemble singularity he will probably win the game but as yeah. long as he's threatening cards out of uh, the Fi's hand he's feeling good if he can throw a two card six and uh, the five blocks with three cards he's feeling great here just a singular snatch coming across protecting the arsenal was alex on that uh, previous block blocked with three cards from hand and then just sending the uh, simple snatch now we are threatening the possible on hit draw card uh, we we're also threatening the activation of Snapdragon Scalers, but we may not even consider, you know, a, a huge block here from the side of Teclavasan because this would be not getting a, a huge amount of value on Snapdragon Scalers unless the arsenal is something particularly spicy. Yeah, and I feel like Majin would feel very good about this situation if he did blow snaps this early. Exactly, and instead choosing to at instant speed activate Teclavasan and then just give both equipments after possibly maybe get both equipments after uh, equipping those uh, steel soul legs the steel soul towers yeah so with running one damage he's probably gonna play out his arsenal here uh coming in for six damage and on hit uh discard a card so it's a pretty good uh two card hand yeah, three for six doesn't feel terrible and uh being able to use that uh arsenal card on turn zero Finally finding the moment is Majin Bay sending the six damage with the on hit. We do have equipment set up. We're trying to, uh, from the 
Tackle of Austin side of things, trying to set up a full suite of equipment. But uh, if Phi has anything to say about it, you want to pressure as much as possible so that you can uh, prevent that from happening, making it that much harder to block all of the breakpoints that could come down the line with snatches and anything that pushes four damage off of uh, you know the activation of Ardvor. Yeah, yeah. Uh, from Teglavasen's side, I would feel very confident in this position, only being down four life after turn four, having two Evos already equipped. I'd be feeling a lot more comfortable than I normally would. And ripping two cards from hand there, not asking for equipment, but here we have a Mounting Anger play, which is going to push a break point. Oh, yeah. Four go again, covered up by the fate foreseen here. Sees a sink below on top and then just chooses to leave it there. A very defensive hand, as you can see. We also have that all you got. We've got to fabricate with uh, Mechanical Strength Blue that gives us the possibility of shooting the gun this turn. Oh, yeah. He's probably thinking of how to use all the cards in his hand after the finally shot one attack. Yeah, the benefit of pivoting off of that uh, arsenaled card from turn zero and threatening the on-hit discard uh, means that you now have, you know, basically just a nerfed turn for your opponent and you can uh, play a little bit more aggressively, perhaps, on your own turn. It's going to send Teclo level, uh, though, here, I believe, pitching that Fabricate. Oh, yeah. Probably looking to Arsenal, that's all you got. Keep the blue in hand. He might use it on the, the uh, attack of Austin to find the D-React that we know in Sink Below to try to dig deeper for the Evos. But this is a really good spot for the Teclo to be at at this point in the game. Being able to sit on that all you got in Arsenal also, I imagine, feels fantastic in this matchup, wouldn't you think? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's probably one of the better Arsenal cards this early. No blocks from the Phi. We have a finally a five card hand on the side of Phi, and that is that's when Phi is at his most terrifying because he has access to resources, access to attacks, and possibly something even like an Art of War, which could be sitting in Arsenal. Uh, he has protected that Arsenal fairly well over the past few turns and tried to find a window for a five card hand. Yeah, yeah, and then draw and hold the line after your five player took. Uh kept five cards in hand is a good feeling too to, to uh, insulate you from the art of war. Goes ahead and sinks a card, draws into another blue. So a blue becomes a blue in hand, but pushing the break points, we're continuing and revealing off the top the, uh, the snatch that's coming next turn. It's like when you're staring down the, you know, the train tracks and the light is slowly coming towards you. That's the feeling oh, yeah. when you see that on top of the deck. Oh yeah, you always have to be cognizant of it. Still quite healthy, both in life total, but also in block ability on equipment. We're giving a piece of equipment here uh, to block, but there's the breakpoint attack, oh. and that's not one you want to see, especially after you block incidental damage on the previous attack with your equipment. This could have been a full equipment block, but now it's going to require some amount of cards from hand. Yeah, he's probably looking to try to keep the controller in hand so he can play it. Hmm. So he might try to block with boots, and that's all you got, and then play out the controller on his turn. Right. Having the that's all you got in the arsenal there does come up clutch, simply denying that uh, on-hit draw. It may not have meant anything with the arsenal still just sitting there and the uh, snaps being used for perhaps less value, but there is the play out of the uh, Steel Soul controller, and we are up to three pieces, and uh, things are starting to come together for Teclavas, and Majin Bey is, is clawing his way through this uh, early oh, game wow. into the mid-game. Yeah, I mean, he drew a thing below for the snatch, he's got the helmet and everything. I mean, this this is a really good position. Tecla. Sink below played. Now, this is the, the oh, the backbreaker, I was oh. about to say. <laughs> when you perfectly cover oh. this up, and then they finally play the Art of War in Arsenal. I, I'd wondered if that was perhaps the Arsenal lurking there, and you just can't respect it. It's kind of like playing against uh, Katsu and uh, never respecting the possibility of like an ancestral empowerment. But here, it's going to do absolute work. Art of War coming down with the plus one, the banish draw two, a three card hand, a hit on hit draw card. We have the uh, possibility of a mask of the pouncing links. The world is Alex's oyster, and his it's now his game to lose with the driver's seat being firmly planted there on his side. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if we see chain link seven or eight here. And he has the blue to pitch as well. He's got a four-card hand. 
it's available to swing the blade if he chooses to. And it's a fine balancing act for the Teclo to not block too much so the tenacity doesn't come in and just blow you out of the water. Same with the salt of wound. So he's going to be doing a balancing act all turn. That is one of the most powerful uh, cards for that Fi received from this most recent set is tenacity. It's It pairs so well with salt the wound. Uh, whether or not you're going for that off of Pouncing Links or if you're going for Tenacity, both are just equally terrifying in different ways. Oh, yeah. This card is amazing. I like that he's trying to keep here a two-card hand of Command and & Conquer and the uh, final Evo piece on top. If he's allowed to get out of this turn with perhaps the opponent getting an arsenal, maybe he chooses to send the CNC and threaten that arsenal to try and keep parity. Uh, if he has to block with it, I'm sure he'd be comfortable throwing those cards out there as well. But managing through this turn fairly well and not taking too much of a life drop in doing so. No, no. Uh, Fies at 38 cards is something to always be looking at. So this deck can fatigue as we've seen multiple streams now. Indeed it can, but another double strike coming down out of the chain link. As you said, we might be pushing to chain link seven. I think that is a foregone conclusion at this point. Oh, yeah. Kind of wondering if the card in hand is going to be a blue. It's going to go Ember Blade, Phoenix Flame, and then whatever card he fetches up here. If it's the tenacity, it's a rough decision on whether to block out the sword in Phoenix Flame because it makes the tenacity plus one. So he's going to have to think and do the math here. A crack of the pouncing links, and uh, Alex is looking for what he wants to pull from the deck. And uh, what would you what would you take in this scenario? Are you leaning more towards uh, Mask of the Pouncing Links grabbing Tenacity? Uh, I haven't looked at the list to see if it's in there, but I would assume that Tenacity is now making the cut just completely. Or would you go for Assault the Wound? I would 100% go in for a Tenacity, because a Tenacity has this weird effect that the cards you block with are actually blocking for two instead of three because that plus one is going to go onto that tenacity, making your hand a weaker blocking hand. The uh, player is not indeed inactive and not claiming victory, so don't worry, everyone. Looks like it was tenacity, and I do agree. I think that card is so good for Phi now. Oh, yeah. And again, it just de-incentivizes uh, you from throwing something in front of this uh, Ember Blade here, so it's going to force three more damage, and then you have to deal with the damage from the Tenacity after that, which is also buffed up by the Art of War. Yeah, so if the math is correct, uh, the Tenacity should be coming in for six. If he blocks here, it should be seven. And that's a pretty good turn ender. Yeah. Oh, wait. Yeah. Phoenix Flame coming across, perhaps, as well. No, he doesn't have the resources for it, perhaps, Eight. nevertheless. Oh, Art of War. Yeah, yeah. Art of War is going to push some serious Ooh. damage. That was a turn and a half. And uh, now, just blink and you miss it. The, uh, the Teclavasan down to 17. And that's the kind of turn that you're really trying to set up if you are on the side of Alex and Fi. You're trying to set up these big five-card hands with Art of Wars. Go that far across... It's, you're getting value out of that Mask of the Pouncing Links at the perfect time, and this was a time where you're getting, you know, four, in this case, five value out of that uh, out of that equipment. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he's probably looking here to possibly block with two cards, the favor scene and another blue, probably the protocol, and he's going to look to try to play the helmet, and then once he has done that, he will have assembled tr Tron. <laughs> yep. And we're just going to look for the singularity. That's, I assume, the game plan he's going to be looking for here. Uh, standard four-card hand, no pitch to start off, so you have no information as to what could follow up here. But starting off with a Ronin Renegade, it's basically just a uh, head jab. Zero for three. Chain starter. Continuing with the Ember Blade, we do have a blue, and that does speak to what this turn can sort of unfold into. Not going to block there. And following up with a blue brand with Cinder Claw does have an on-play effect. Uh, it is going to make Draconic the next thing that you play, but in this case, we're not going to worry, it looks like, because we're just grabbing and sending the Phoenix Flame. Yeah. It's a good clean block from the Teclo. He's hoping that the Fi here just passes. He can play out his headpiece, Arsenal Faith for Scene, and be looking good for next turn. Staying, uh, yes, we're at a 13 life to 36, but the life totals don't really tell the story here. Uh, so we're staying pretty healthy. 
from the Teklavos. And we do have a singular blocking a piece of equipment. Yes, all four of them can block, but the moment that they all block one more time without the use of fabricate, they will explode based on temper. So we're using our block here and uh, gonna try to wall up a little bit with a sink below and fate foreseen in circulation on our side of Teklavasen. But Fi pushing another five card hand and Alex is looking to really get this life total way down. Yeah, uh, he's probably looking here to block with both the D reacts, and then on his turn look to throw the uh, war machine, uh, the tank, mm, Terminator tank, possibly coming down. But searing Ember Blade as the third chain link here, coming across for three, and nine is a precarious life total to be at. Yeah, that's just a three card hand from Phi. <laughs> hey, you're not wrong. Phoenix Flame coming for one. Does not get the benefit of the Shuko. It's the first attack that is less than two, two or less. And uh, this is going to reveal an Art of War on top, and that is a terrifying prospect. Oh. When you know your opponent has an Art of War coming up in the next hand, you you almost like are priced into trying to disrupt their turn prior. And we have the capability of doing that if we're on the Teclo side because we're throwing Terminator tank. Yeah, I mean, that's the best follow-up you can have here, honestly. Try to disrupt their big turns. Arsenal that paper scene. I believe that there is a war machine on top of his deck. I think he kept it on top. So hopefully he cycles out his arsenal. Hopefully it's an attack. Uh, and you get to Art of War and destroy it. So let's see. So. Arsenaling the sink below, and we've got to fabricate. That's a wow. huge draw on this turn. The best draw right there. And walk us through why Fabricate is so powerful in this exact moment and what its sort of functionality on a turn that could go super wide is. So looking at Fabricate in this hand, uh, it is essentially a zero for four block because uh, it will turn your two, uh, your three tempers into four tempers, essentially, making them block for two here. And they do not break at the end of uh, the turn, which is going to be a big deal for covering up things. So he's probably doing some math in his head. Uh, it also allow him to filter. Uh, one of the Evos in hand, depending on if he wants to do that. Okay, he decides to just put it underneath for the singularity attacks later. But uh, since he gets the, he would have been able to banish a headpiece or arm piece and a draw a card to cycle. But in this scenario, his equipment went from one block, uh, one one essential block without breaking anything, to five, and that's pretty good. Yeah, it's quite nice. And so yeah. it does give him the capability of, of covering up a lot more damage, particularly if this is an Art of War turn. But looking as we haven't pitched into anything on the Phi side of things, I think uh, Alex may be looking at this and saying, well, this is fine. I'm, I'm comfortable playing out my Arsenal, perhaps, maybe the other card, and then Arsenaling an Art of War and waiting for you not to have this extra block ability on your side of things. Yeah, I'll be surprised if he plays the Art of War this turn. Making use of the extra block while you have it is quite wise, and that's what we see uh, Majin Bay doing here, blocking extra. And these do have one extra block, meaning that the temper is not going to explode them. If you're worried that he's about to lose all of his equipment, uh, just don't worry too much. It's, it's going to be all right. He's going to be able to cover up these, and they will stick. Yeah. Uh, probably thinking about how he's going to block through the rest of the turn. Uh, Probably just trying to use the chess piece on maybe the Phoenix Flame to cover it up. Oh, pitching the Art of War. That's interesting. Wow. So knowing uh, that the Art of War is in hand, maybe trying to conceal some information into what's going to the arsenal, unless he has two Art of Wars in hand, which would be just the stone cold bluff of the century if he has two Art of Wars <laughs> and sending one would be yeah, absolutely yeah. fantastic. Oh, yeah. It would be awesome here. Oh, and finishing with oh. a Lava Burst. Okay, pushing the damage uh, that is not face up and just saying, okay, you're going to have to deal with this. You're going to have to meet the damage. Uh, that is going to put you to two if you don't, uh, if you don't respect it at all. And if you want to play out your turn, you're going to have to figure out how to play a one-card hand. So it looks like he's going uh, to just give him three, perhaps? Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll be really surprised if he doesn't block with both of them here and then Scrap Trader both of them back and then equipped one. Because uh, Scrap Trader will... Uh, uh, Make enough resources that you should be able to play them. So, with a single blue next hand, 
Yeah, it looks like he's okay. just going to arsenal the scrap trader, which is totally yeah, fine as well. Maybe sit on the uh, sit on the card and wait for another turn where you can maybe make more use of that off of a single yeah. blue, like you mentioned. Yeah. <sighs> so, probably thinking about how he can play this war machine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you can hold on to a blue plus war machine against your uh, opponent's four card hand, you'd be feeling pretty comfortable. And you can also perhaps, depending on how the sequencing goes, get value out of that all you got uh, to draw a card. Maybe you can count on a blue being on top of your deck and then block with three cards from your hand, draw the uh, that all you got card. Yeah, that sounds pretty amazing to me. So he's probably trying to think about how he's going to throw the Phoenix Flame this turn to utilize that. That that's all you got this turn. Mm -hmm. Coming in with a three on the Searing Ember Blade, we uh, have zero resources floating. We're face up on that. He's going to play a Brand with Cinderclaw. Yeah. Drew into two of them, and this is a perfect time for it. Yeah. So. Covering that. Oh well, but there's the the very powerful double strike because this is going to get the Shugo trigger. It is incredibly hard to block if you are Teclavasan because these cards are just tiny little pokes that just keep coming at you. But it is going to push a, a fair bit of extra damage. Yeah, and I believe that one was actually Draconic, so he might be able to activate Phi also and come in with the Phoenix Flame here. That's true. Off of the. Annoying brand with cinder claw and it does look like that is going to buy the uh the card out thinking about whether or not he wants to give a blue or wants to give the uh war machine yeah there's the phi activation and the phoenix flame that comes across for an additional one putting him down to three drawing a blue so he could have given a blue to uh, maybe make that war machine play but instead we have the available scrap trader that you mentioned on the previous turn yeah yeah, this card is very powerful, and it's a big engine of Teclo Boston. Going to pitch a blue into it, and it's going to give him the resources from Scrap Trader when it resolves. So. And has Teclo Boston available. Now he can pay those four resources to equip a oh. new piece, and he finds the Singularity. This is huge. If he can stabilize on this turn cycle, then we could see a Singularity flip if he can keep those two blues. It's going to be a really tough ask, but if there's a world where he can somehow stabilize on those two blues, we could see this game pivot completely. Oh, yeah. Like, right here, if he can somehow get away with blocking uh, with the two machines and the arm piece and then play Singularity, we might have a game on our hands. And that's And that's, I guarantee you, what he's thinking also. There's a push of a break point. Can we give a card here? And from Alex's side, he's just trying to push those last few points of damage across in the most efficient way, in the most uncomfortable way, sending... Well, this is huge because this allows us... Opens a, opens the door for the uh, Phoenix Flame grab, which sends another point of damage. Yeah, and that would essentially send him to one, uh, meaning if that last card in hand is an attack... Majin is sweating right now because he's just hoping that he arsenals here. If he sets the arsenal... No, it's Salt oh. the Wound! Oh, he has to give him both cards, which means his play oh. is absolutely nil on the next turn. So painful to see the Salt the Wound. If that was an arsenal, this game would have oh. pivoted and this would have popped off completely. But here and now, we're in full defense mode. We don't even have two blues in hand, so we're definitely trying to block out and sitting at one against a Phi who can go get Phoenix Flames. Maybe you can play to a Fatigue out if your opponent isn't going to grab Phoenix Flame every turn. Maybe yeah. you can take those 19 cards. Yeah, maybe. Uh, we'll just have to see what he's pitching and kind of keep track of everything. Pitching a Tenacity is a pretty scary sign, though, because that is a scary card in this position. To have the, the D react there to cover up the breakpoint of four is huge, but I don't know how he's going to get anywhere near out of this. He's going to, oh, and the arsenal saves him a little bit. Doesn't have a blue to play out, but he can use Liquid Cool Mayhem as a one card play, sending on okay. six damage. Nothing wrong with that. One card six is pretty good rate. More than content to just try and set up and play out a five card hand, though. And yeah, this is so where things get that crazy. That, mm. that he pitched. 
the final wow. solid block there on the Steel Street Enforcers, which uh, was pitched early in oh, the yeah. game. Let's see. No activation of Art of War. You didn't need to reveal it there, but you uh, you have the capability of maybe playing towards it after blocks are declared as a final sort of push over the top. Blocked with the equipment. Phoenix Flame comes for two. They're uh -oh. grabbing it, and let's see what's in the arsenal. Let's see what's in the hand. <laughs> Going to throw the final... The final block, perhaps? Maybe. And no arsenal. But this is this is dire straits now because we have officially blown up the headpiece. So that singularity parked in the arsenal there, unfortunately, cannot be activated. We have to make our way to another fabricate just to get the uh, proto, just to get the steel soul, just to get back to the spot. So now it's all or nothing. And, oh, there's the art of war to leap over the top. And I think that's just going to do it. Hold the line saves you for now, but yeah, everything then, after uh, this is buffed. Yeah, but uh, he also has three prevention floating though, so let's see. That is true. That. Might let's see if he uh, follows this up with a with another breakpoint. And this, I think, is is nicely covered up with some of the prevention. Oh, he's gonna no, he's gonna change it up. The three damage prevention is there, but that arsenal is is frozen to the end of time, basically, at this point. Oh, yeah. Going to try to keep that prevention floating across, covering that up for four. Gives the scrap trader here, along with that prevention... We'll keep him alive. The Phoenix Flame's going to be might. grabbed. Yep. It might come up. Shuko says no prevention. <laughs> there we go. Oh, but that's just going to do it. Eight damage can't be covered. And that is the game. Majin has a window, has a moment, has a possibility to maybe put some things together. But unfortunately... Could not pull it out in the end. And congratulations to Alex for on Fi for finding the windows and pushing those massive damage uh, turns to pick up the win. What do you think about that game? How do you think that uh, how do you think that played out? Did it go as you expected it to? It went about as as I expected, but the Tech Lavasin definitely put up a better fight than I was expecting. He found his Evos quickly. He uh, assembled Tron as quickly as possible. I think the Singularity is maybe a turn or two late. I think if you'd have seen a turn or two earlier, it would have been a very close game. Yeah, that, you're 100% right. If we would have seen that thing pop up maybe two turns earlier and he had the life total to just manipulate a little bit, that game could have gone into overdrive. But uh, a very close one and a tough loss for Majin. But again, congratulations to uh, Alex on five for picking up the win there. And that's not the only game we have for you because we have Michael versus Matt, Victor versus Azuri. What is your take on this matchup? I'll tell you right now, this is not a matchup that I have played yet. Uh, Victor being a brand new hero from Heavy Hitters. Uh, I love Victor. It's actually one of my favorite heroes as of recent. Uh, the Victor Azuri matchup is going to be almost like a Guardian Mirror is what it's going to feel like. Uh, the victor is going to look for go again, rouse the ancients, zealous beltings, occasional pummel. I assume Michael is on tunic, so we're going to look for like even a, a zealous pummel sledge turn to win the game. Uh, this is not going to be a two card eight kind of game because they're both going to fatigue each other over time. So he's going to be looking to try to kill Usuri. I'm really excited to see this one. I can't wait to uh, watch it unfold. So let's jump down into it together and see how this one goes. And it does look like, um, I, I believe we were told beforehand that there was a little bit of a, a visual bug on this one. doesn't look like we can see the uh, hands of either player, so we can't necessarily keep as easy of track as that. And there's a just a cat right in the face down at the bottom of Matt. Matt's cat decided to make uh -oh. the appearance. Uh, but it looks like these players jumping in and getting things rolling right away. Yeah, so a really interesting thing to note here is that the victor's actually on Anathos without uh, tech plating 
Unlike Bravo, if he has two blues in hand, he can actually turn Anathos into a six power if he doesn't have a pitch outlet. So more than likely, the reason he has Anathos is so he can go rouse the Ancients into Anathos. Mm -hmm. A very similar That's Bravo game plan, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he just doesn't want to get stuck on two blues in hand. That's probably the thing he's looking to not do. So Michael's passed on over to uh, and he uh, just goes ahead and yeah. sends the old Anathos for six. Uh, has an arsenal available. Uh, based on this, I don't believe that was the first turn. I believe that was the, the second turn of the game, I think. Uh, and so this would be perhaps his hand if he blocked previously. Uh, nevertheless, yeah. we're going to try to keep track as best we can of the uh, hand sizes and the blocks made so that we can kind of uh, give you the best that we possibly can for uh, for the hand tracking as we go through the game. Yeah, something else to note that uh, I believe uh, Michael also brought in uh, 50, uh, 66 cards or 65 cards, so he is planning for a long game here. Missouri playing a uh, a much more conservative, looks like a clean 60 with the 54 yeah. in uh, in deck plus the 4 and the uh, hand in circulation. Maybe a little bit more than that. Yeah, I think on. 62. Yeah, it could be 62 based on the uh, hand plus the arsenal there. Yeah. Uh, sending the Ravenous Rabble for 4, we can't quite make out what was revealed off the top, um, so we don't have perfect information there. We uh, did block with a card from hand previously, so we do have follow-ups to this turn. Uh, we have Nerve Scalpel and Spider's Bite, if you're uh, keeping track at home, available to us. And uh, that feels pretty solid into, really into the field. I feel like that's a, a solid just pick up and run out there into the field. Yeah, yeah. Uh, since Victor works with Clashes, he doesn't have as many D-Reacts, so he, we're going to see uh, Matt really lean on Spider's Bite, I believe. Certainly playing aggressively here in the outset. We've seen Ravenous Rabbles already played multiple times. Trying to send that damage on over. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. Let's so, see what the follow-up is here. Yeah, so what that tells me is that he's probably not going to be playing a lot of the contracts uh, with the Mask of Perdition. So he's going to be on more of the red line that we've seen as of late. The one that we saw really, really affect Lexi in that meta. So this is probably a modified version of that. Mm -hmm. Here's the uh, pitch of the Codex of Frailty that is important to keep track of as it goes to the bottom of the deck. Because if we are into a second cycle pitch stack type game, then that is going to circle back around very, uh, you know, throughout the game and, and quite soon. And there's a, a pitch of a, uh, a yellow death touch as well. That yellow, is not, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's not a card you necessarily see very often. Oh, yeah. That just means he's here to kill him. Yeah. Death Touch <laughs> is quite aggressive. And look, this is the play you were talking about uh, earlier. Sending the Zealous Belting, pitching a blue. Thing here is we also have to watch it on... Uh, whenever Tunic is on three, we always want to pay attention to those turns, too. Because he can just always pummel out of nowhere. Wow, this is a great follow-up. Zealous into a Spinal Crush, taking the Tunic resource. Uh, that is a very, very big and uh, chunky attack, but uh, it may, depending on the uh, hand composition on Azuri's side, it may not end up mattering too terribly much if we do have the, uh, you know, switch ability available to us at attack reaction speed if we do get nerfed. But here, just a simple cover-up of that crush effect, taking two damage. Yeah, yeah, the big thing Spinal will do in this matchup is just to avoid the daggers. Mm. And the daggers are very annoying, but Victor also has block cards in his exactly. deck, which... You know, hey, leave no witnesses. Here's a test of strength. Uh, now we're equal. It's like, okay. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting to look at uh, the assassin weapons and how they play on this certain axis of, uh, you know, very good into, like, specific matchups. Uh, very good into matchups with attack reactions. Very good into matchups with attack action cards. And then Victor just looks across the table and says, no, I'm good. Anyway, trounce. It's like, okay, cool. <laughs> All right, that's how we're playing it. Fine. So be it. These daggers mean nothing to me. Sending the <laughs> one damage across, pitching the second Codex of Frailty that we've seen in circulation. Yeah, that that's interesting. So that Michael has to be aware that there's only going to be one in the next 50 cards. <laughs> yeah. It's a little bit easier to play around when you when you don't have to think about it. Those uh, those cards are incredibly powerful in the late game, though. I feel like their power scales immensely when you find them in the late game. So pitching them... Oh, and look, we are playing the super aggressive version because we are playing looking for a scrap, coming down and scrapping a card. Oh, and Uzuri makes the gold off the test of strength. <laughs> what? <laughs> what did we uh. reveal? Oh, man. What I would give to see the, re the revelation there. 
Oh. Sometimes you win some, sometimes you get free gold. Yeah, um, yeah. I'm wondering how uh, Matt's going to use that gold later in the game. Uh, coming across with a vanilla thunk for six, pitching two blues to play a blue here. No tunic on line. The three card six. Guardian <laughs> numbers right there. Yep. No tunic means, uh, depending on the hand, I don't think we're too terribly scared of pummel, but if we do have a card in hand, then it is available to us from the arsenal, perhaps. Oh, yeah. Looking at the hand composition, though, he's really hoping for that test of strength so he could uh, rouse the ancients there. I, I, I noticed that. Mm. Ooh, and we do have an isolate being played. Uh, we have one card left in hand, so let's see if there is a swap. You'll swap in here. Remember, this does have Dominate. It's a stealth card, and it does give us the capability of swapping in. Here is another Clash. Oh, my lord. <laughs> I love how both of them just stoically accept the fate of this Vigor token being passed on over to Azuri. Yeah. That is... Oof. So no swap in. Instead, we're just going to play the Red Shred. Oh, no, oh, there is the swap in. Here we go. Oh, and a follow-up with the Fate Foreseen being played down to try and cover up some of that damage. Shred comes in and stops the Clash of Vigor from basically blocking, but let's see what the play out and the swap out is here. Oh, and a perfect time C and C. Oh, that was a great play from Michael. The follow-up with the Cranial Crush, pushing eight damage, pitching the uh, two blues for that. And let's see how it's covered Super up. relevant on hit, since you gave him a gold. So, <laughs> perfect. <laughs> exactly. That's exactly what you plan on in this, in this specific matchup. When you yeah. give your opponent the gold, you want to stop them from drawing cards on their turn. The Vigor yeah. pops, as it should, in Azuri, and uh, now you have a one resource floating. In Looks fact, like it will not be used. Yeah, another stealth card coming down. It does have the capability if it hits on the on hit, it does create a blood rot pox, so it is going to get respected here. Not sure if there's a card in hand. I would imagine that there's a card in hand here threatening, but it could just be the vanilla play. It looks like it was. Let's see if there's an arsenal. Ooh, and the Anothos for four damage, only pitching the macho. Anothos for might four. Might be a pummel here. Hmm. Tunic's on three. Yeah, it could be. Tunic's sitting on three. We have full equipment suite available to us. Uh, so this game is nowhere near its conclusion. There it is. There's the pummel coming down. No force on the discard here because we do not have uh, we do not have an attack action that's being played on. Instead, this is just the the old hammer for ten play that you had back in the WTR days, actually. Way before I played. <laughs> well, we can always go revisit that. In heavy hitters, basically. Yeah, yeah. Amazing set. One comes across, makes the attack actions a little bit more uncomfortable to block. We keep missing on the Ravenous Rabble. It's the second Ravenous Rabble for three, I believe, we've played this game. Hey, <laughs> Victor did it. <laughs> he finally gets his own trigger. Clash of Might comes down, makes a Might token. Uh, off the uh, block and the effect there on Clash of Might. Does leak a damage. And as you can see, these life totals are steadily decreasing. Both players are, uh, you know, definitely content to block and, and uh, send their own damage, but they are not blocking fully. We're not playing this sort of fatigue style, uh, Victor, that you might have seen floating around. Uh, we are willing to trade damage here. Oh, yeah. Codex of Blood Rot. Okay. Now, how many times have you seen a Codex of Blood Rot get resolved from your opponent in the past few uh, weeks and Ooh. months, Taylor? Very few. I always assume when they play that, there's a leave no witnesses coming right at my face. <laughs> Gives the Blood Rot pox. It allows you to drop something in Arsenal. It looks oh. like it was an E-Strike coming across. Okay. I believe all the codices are just fantastic to uh, just give you that extra point of value and give you an extra card in a lot of cases because of, because of the ponder. Sending for seven is an E-strike. Two of the three are great designs. I'll say that. <laughs> Wait, which one's the not good design? I'll let you think about it. 
you would it wouldn't be the one that just got resolved, would it? Mm-hmm. Uh. That was it. <laughs> Leave a comment down below with your thoughts on Codex of Blood Rot. Sound off in the comments below as we resolve the damage here, pushing and being blocked. And the, the Blood Rot Pox is going to stick around. Anothos comes across for five, thanks to the Might token being popped at the beginning of the turn. Blocking with a red isolate. Interesting block. It could certainly speak to the hand composition um, based on, you know, perhaps either a great arsenal card that you were able to draw into off the ponder. Wow, okay, you're giving two incredibly powerful cards and a very good two-card combo. So it looks like the hand was pretty juiced. Let's see what else he has available to him. Oh, he has a blue isolate from arsenal. Oh. <laughs> How terrifying is it to see an isolate be blocked with and to leave no witnesses, and then your opponent just plays another isolate saying, yeah, the card I'm going to swap into is better than yeah. leave no witnesses. Yeah, that, that's not what I want to see at all. Those are cards I don't want to see blocking. And if you're wondering why the Fate Foreseen here is being resolved before the Azuri Switchblade, this is, a, this is the perfect order um, for exactly the swap we saw earlier, if they are swapping into a Command and Conquer, because if that is resolved before you play Fate for Scene, it cannot then go down because you can't play uh, defense reactions against uh, Command and Conquer. Yeah. That looks like to be a great play. Three damage. Yeah, just like I said, it's going to be a Guardian Mirror. Both players uh, dropping down into uh, about half health now. Sending the spider's bite on the side of Matt Coles. Both of these players, I should point out, uh, won their first game in week one of the Arclight League, sitting at 1-0, and oh, looking to uh, make their way up to 2-0, and oh, and there's the uh, send of the old death touch. Oh, hitting wow. the double. Goal. Oh my gosh, that's another play you, uh, you love to see. We get the test of strength that reveals the golden sun, which gives you the gold off the golden sun, and the test of strength. And now you are sitting pretty on yeah, the side. Yeah, I think it's probably one of the strongest cards in the new set, actually. It's not it's not super flashy, but it's super efficient. And this is a very powerful uh, play here, because we are going to be ripping cards out of the hand if the block isn't uh, able to be made. We do have equipment available to us on the side of Zuri if we want to uh, give up two pieces of equipment plus a card in hand. But... Will that be the uh, name of the game here? Oh, yeah. Matt's probably thinking about that right now. You probably do not want to give up Tunic this early, so... I won't be surprised if he blocks with a card from hand, discards two, and then comes in. Wow! Maybe we have a uh, D-reaction D hand as well, or the yeah. one in Arsenal. This makes, yeah. a, uh, makes a solid response. Yeah. But being able to uh, pressure with Terra Sunder on this turn definitely gives a lot of tempo and a lot of uh, leeway if you don't have exactly Sync Below in response to it. And so it's uh, very fortuitous for Matt to have a Sync Below paired with both of these equipment blocks. Yeah, and it's also probably much scarier knowing that there's a Golden Sun in Arsenal that he's probably going to blue tunic next turn right into your dome. Yeah. Most definitely the Spider's Bite coming in to try and uh, provide some amount of disruption on this turn, making blocking that much harder. The good old yellow Death Touch. Yeah, it's the, what, third Death Touch yellow that we've seen now? Two pitched, one played, I think. Yeah. One coming across, and uh, let's see what the follow-up is to this being uh, taken. On the red. <laughs> Just from the arsenal. Pitching a red death touch. So he had the... Leave a uh, kind, baby. There it is. All right, put that down on your bingo cards, everyone. You see three death touches on the table at once. And it's so much more uncomfortable to try and cover up and block out because the uh, connection of the spider's bite there. There's the cover-up. Going to give a uh, quicken token off of the block with civic steps. A card that guardians desperately needed. Another uh, blocking piece of equipment. It looks like he had to rebuy his Clash there. Looks like it. Yeah, that's shocking and uh, something you don't necessarily want. Maybe we had a tie on the first time and then he 
repurchased. I assume he's going to get big old Golden Sun here for 11. There's the take of the tunic, and the Golden Sun comes across. Destroying the gold, and there is the uh, 11 overpower. And that, I think, is very, very comfortable driving from this point. Victor can really kind of seize some control, uh, depending on how well blocked this can be. This can be blocked because it's overpower, can be blocked by a card from hand, an action card, and possibly a reaction card. So let's see how the block is made, but there's definitely going to be some damage leak on this turn. Oh, yeah. And he does have the, the reaction here, sinking. Let's see if he sinks a card. Possibly draws into it, maybe like, oh, he's got Whoa. two. Oh my God. Forget everything I said about damage leak. The absolute nut hand. Two D reacts, one oh. in arsenal, one in hand, and the cover up. And that is massive. What a great hand there. And if also, my count is correct, I think he has two cards still. Yeah, a notable thing to notice there is he did block with a shakedown, which is a power card in this matchup. Mm hmm. Nerve scalpel coming across. He has a blues pitched. I wouldn't there's, be surprised if we see that codex here. There's a uh, trounce being revealed. Can't quite make out who wins each of the first ones. We'll see as the resolution occurs. Doesn't look like uh, much being gone there. There's the uh, pitch follow up with the spider's bite. So I wonder what the final card in hand is. Yeah. If it is, as you said, the third codex of frailty, then we could have a huge power turn right here. But uh, notable that uh, Victor's arsenal is covered up. And so you're not going to have the force arsenal and then uh, discard effect. Yeah, well, I wouldn't be surprised if it was also a leave no witnesses. That would be my best guess as of right now. Yeah. I mean, that is one of the best case scenarios. Either you find the leave no witnesses from the graveyard or you have the leave no witnesses in hand. Either way, you're asking for blocks. Oh, oh, my Lord. <laughs> this is very wins all the clashes. I I will say this. I was not expecting to see this many clash wins from the Azuri side, and it is the Codex of Frailty. On a theoretical level, you could see how, uh, you know, some number of fives and sixes could be quite good to win clashes, particularly against a hero that has clash cards and uh, block cards in your deck. But to do th this consistently is is quite surprising. Yeah, this. Yeah. The fate foreseen from the uh, hand being uh, being played down to meet the leave no witnesses four covering four. And that is probably going to wrap the turn, but you're very happy if you are on the side of Matt to uh, go in this turn cycle completely covering a overpowered Golden Sun, and then with the remaining cards in hand, be able to go Dagger, Dagger, Codex, Leave No Witnesses. Yeah, and it was a really smart block from Michael there on the Spider's Bite to make sure that the uh, Fate for Scene was actually fully covering the Leave No Witnesses, so it was a really heads-up play there. The one time the nerf scalpel is actually required to block here. Perfectly timed. Yeah. Very impressive. That was a uh, that was a turn cycle for the ages because he also wins a vigor on that turn. Able to get the arsenal off of the ponder token and send for a casual three. Another thing to notice here is that the victor is also up 10. Uh, it looks like 14 cards. That is very true. Yeah. That is a massive difference if you decide to take this into a uh, sort of a fatigue state. You've given up a good number of your equipment blocks. You still have some available to you, though, compared to Azuri, who's literally just down to Tunic. And so Azuri, the, uh, the tempo and sort of the onus is on them to seal this game up. Playing, looking for a scrap, coming down, and uh, going to go ahead and send for five. Go again. And then there's the another trounce. Very good there. Here's the trounce play. Looks like we win and uh, pick up the might and vigor there. And yeah, you're right. The vigor made a huge difference to be able to play that out. The 
Let's see what the follow-up to this is. It did have go again. Looking for scrap, of course, picked up the go again. Sending with a spider's bite, pitching there. Yeah, and Michael still has four cards in hand due to Victor's ability of drawing when the gold is made, so mm. he's probably feeling very good here, too. One damage, go again with piercing, one floating. We still have cards available to us on the side of Matt Coles. Taking some amount of aggression now. The aggressive position, sending an Enlightened Strike. This, depending on cards in hand, and I'm not quite sure where we're at with that because we did have to bottom a card just now with Enlightened Strike. Uh, this could be a snappable turn. We have a resource floating. Yeah. Maybe the card in Arsenal that we uh, managed to get off the Ponder is something that we want to play into. Maybe it's another one of those death touches. Maybe. We'll have to see. Looks like not. Oh. It looks like the card in Arsenal might be maybe a shred. Can we saw him Arsenal that earlier? Hmm. Two floating. And the casual seven CNC. It's not a two card block anymore. Now we've decided to upgrade it. Thanks to the might token, we have the plus one on the command and conquer. And like you said, two floating. And everybody knows the uh, meme within flesh and blood. If you see two floating on a CNC, you know what might be coming. Let's see if he's content to give up the uh, tunic here. or No, he's going to make a three card block. Ah, like, the arsenal. Hmm. Looks like it was a red infect. Do we have the Azuri activation? We do. Azuri's going to activate here. Now, there's a moment here for uh, responses, but there are going to be no responses, and Shakedown comes across. And this is a greatly timed Shakedown. Yeah, Matt's been playing the last four or five turns amazingly to turn this game back around. And talk us through what Shakedown is doing here, as it's a, a little hard to make out, of course, with cards in hand. So Shakedown at this point is probably naming red to get a power card, knowing that if he has two blues in hands, he can't Anathos for six. So he's probably just looking for a big red attack, such as like a Spinal Crush at this point in the game. Maybe uh, red, is, uh, since he did black with a red disable. Oh, he named blue. He's trying to take... Okay. Interesting. Chooses right. to banish a blue card. Like you said, I would have considered the red as well. Uh, just to try and slow things down, but maybe trying to starve the uh, hand of resources to slow the uh, tempo down. Here we have the follow-up with Zealous Belting. Nevertheless, now you, as the Azuri, have the life lead on the victor, 15 to 11, and you have all the tricks up your sleeve. I would be feeling fairly comfortable from the Azuri position uh, to have that life lead and to make some of these more back-and-forth plays going forward. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, late game Spider Bite holds a lot of weight in that one card. Uh, having piercing is very relevant and stuff like that, yeah. We have the uh, block on the CNC with a CNC. Put that on your bingo card as well. Into the turn, into the arsenal. And then a follow-up with the Zealous Belting. They are just slinging these massive power uh, sort of turns back and forth. Yeah, um... So I will assume that we might see a four for eight guardian card here or an Anathos in Arsenal it would probably be a safe bet. So that's what uh, Matt's probably thinking at this point. Oh my yep, and a golden eight. sound. A there it is. Yeah. One of the best four you can find. Yeah, that's, that's pretty solid. Uh, if, as numbers go, those are several great numbers. It's going to meet it with a sink below, which is going to cover... Four damage. And uh, the life lead is now gone and passed back over with tempo over to the victor side of things. That was a massive uh, swing turn there to be able to steal that tempo with uh, Zealous Belting into the Golden Sun. Yeah, one thing there to notice is that uh, he could have blocked with a card in hand, Matt. So I assume that Michael here is aware that the two cards in Matt's hand... Uh, will probably be relevant with the snaps this turn. So he's probably keeping that in mind. Yeah. Covering up here with a test of strength. Interesting to block with a test of strength now because uh, if we do end up swapping into something that is not snappable, then uh, the test of strength is great. But if you snap here, then you're taking the value from uh, crown and from test of strength as far yeah. as blocking is concerned. 
Yeah, this is a very safe block from Michael to play around the third shakedown that we haven't seen or a de red death touch. It's a very heads up block. Also noticeable here, since he made the gold, uh, Michael's also on a four card hand in, at this point in the turn. There we go. And he does choose to snap here. Snap comes across and it just robs the value on that blocking side of things. Blocking for six on something that was literally just representing two. Let's see how we follow it up. There was a death touch in circulation so that yellow he did make it back to that he had been pitching. So there was the capability of the swap there. So it did, in some essence, prevent that amount of damage. Yeah, so I think this would make this card in hand left a codex. We might see that, I believe. And there it is. The pitch stack has returned the codex that we saw pitched next to that yellow death touch. At the beginning of the game is now cycled back around. Now, we have a tunic up. We could go grab uh, something as simple as a... Uh, a zero for four, but we have the tunic available, so we can grab a death touch if we choose. Yeah, so I believe that the top card of Matt's deck is actually another yellow death touch, so that'd be a great arsenal card off this codex, I believe. He did pitch uh, death touch, death touch back to back along with that codex, so I believe you're right. We'll see it as the uh, turns unfold here. I, we can't quite make out what he grabbed as the, uh, as the sidebar there is a little covered up, but we'll find out together. Nevertheless, we know that there were cards committed to block, and we know that the Spider's Bite hit, so this is going to be, whatever was grabbed, is going to be a hefty card to block out. Yeah, and if you're in Michael's shoes here, you, you have to be thinking about uh, fatigue. 17 cards, and mm -hmm. you're aware of 10 of them. So, let's see. Probably yep. a red death touch, yep. Yep. Sending for six, taking the tunic, and he's going to have to give him the rest of the hand just to cover this up. And that is one way to claw your way back into a fatigue matchup to be able to steal the hand out each and every turn. And uh, off of the ponder trigger, we're going to arsenal that card and pass on over. The pass following on the victor's turn means that we're going to start off with Nerve Scalpel. And like you mentioned earlier in the game, this is where both daggers can really come into play because we have blues constantly circulating and if we have a uh, you know a tempo moment where we have four cards plus an arsenal we can pitch into nerve scalpel into spider's bite and then follow that up with some tricks oh yeah yeah i will assume that uh we will see a lot of blocking on the spider's bite going forward to avoid both of them because you want a nerve scalpel first into a spider's bite exactly otherwise you can take the uh, damage on that nerve scalpel if it's sent second and basically negate the spider's bite effect, but let's see what the follow-up is. We have two resources floating. We can safely assume that there's probably a death touch lurking in the arsenal there. Uh, we know that there's another Codex of Frailty somewhere. Yep, and there it is. It was actually the oh, Codex yeah. of Frailty. So the Codex is going to be able to come out and grab yet again another powerful card from the, uh, from the old graveyard, drop it into the arsenal, and give us that ponder value. Yeah, uh, from this position, I'll be surprised if it's not a, a C and C. Mm-hmm. CNC is the uh, probably best case scenario here, having the two resources available to us. Oh, no, it's going to oh, be a death he, touch. He's just going to kill him. He, he doesn't care about his arsenal. He's going to take the two cards. Death touch is going to be covered up. There's one floating. I think there's still a, no card in hand. We had discarded it to the isolate. The isolate was discarded. Oh, and he has a shred. Wow. wow. Very good shred there. So he had the two extra cards. He got rid of one of them. He kept the shred in hand so that he could shred and connect on the death touch, which is going to push three down to six. Most likely, we're going to see the activation of that blood rot pox token. Yeah, and then Michael's going to have to make... Oh, uh, oh inertia. look at this. Choosing inertia, robbing him of the arsenal. And that's going to cycle the arsenal away. Uh, does he have a card in hand? Of course, we can't see if he's got a card in hand. Uh, he's going to take the tunic. He does have the last card in hand and the third golden sun. What a powerful play. And you see the you see the look on Matt's face. He just masterfully crafted this endgame. And it's all just being pushed back by this 
massive overpowered attack on Golden Sun. Yeah, let's see if he has any shreds here or any D-reacts. Yep. That's got to be one of his last D-reacts. Covering yeah. him up, saving his life here, down to three. And there's the Spider's Bite swing, pitching a yellow death touch. We still have that in circulation. Ten other cards, plus what's in hand. It's going to come across. Let's see if the cover-up is... Nope, it's not going to be covered up. We have five health left, and there's the blue infect. And at this point, Michael has the capability of knowing what types of threats are still lurking within the deck. He could probably work that out via graveyard and what he's seen pitched. Yeah. I won't be surprised if we see him just block six here with the uh, deck damage that he is doing. Turn over turn with Anathos. Let's see the decision point being made. He's, uh, he's thinking through his options. He has block on the board as well in the form of equipment. So if he wanted to make some sort of a block with equipment, he has that capability. But not much left in deck for Matt. No ability to snap on top of this. We've already used our Snapdragon Scalers on his side. Tunic is not sitting up. And I think we're running out of uh, overall threats. Yeah. Um, I would assume at this rate he has like one or two yellow death touches and a lot of isolates back in his deck from the usury swaps throughout the game. So we're going to be seeing a lot of stealth cards and maybe one or two more power cards. I believe there's one more codex somewhere in his list. Michael really deciding whether or not he wants to respect this. Uh, in fact, how much he wants to respect it. Oh, yeah. He knows the swaps okay. available to him. Michael is probably looking at his graveyard four or five times over, just checking it, making sure. Oh, three shakedown, three death touch, three CNCs. Okay. Yeah, this is the, the moment in the game where both players pick up the graveyard and, and rifle through it about three times, yeah. keeping track of, uh, of threats left in deck. Oh, yeah. The inclusion of the yellow death touches have really made a, a, a pretty big difference here at the end game. He's going to give him the equipment here, not respecting what the swap might be. Perhaps he has a, a D react in hand as well to cover six. If he's got the uh, two equipment block and a possible D react uh, in hand to meet whatever's being swapped into. Michael said, have it. And Matt did. Got the red death touch, and look at that. He just takes down to one, and this is not a position you want to be in. You also have a blood rot pox token. You're sending eight. So that means he's going to want to pay with the blood rot pox. So pitch the blue. Uh, I think this card forces two cards out of his hand, and then he can spider bite, spider bite, get two cards out of his hand. This is a super interesting game. Yes, there down to the wire. Isolate. Look at this, both yeah. players down to one. Tunic goes up on the side of Matt and Azuri, and he's just able to follow wow. it up with, that's a huge play. If this has a go again, he can actually draw a card off the quick end and then spider bite to get three cards out of hand here. Because of and piercing, he can't block with Tunic, effectively. And that's exactly wow. what he chooses. Takes the draw card option. Has eight cards left in circulation in his deck. He's going to follow up with Nerve Scalpel. Oh, wow. This Actually, it's all four cards from a hand with Tunic. Wow. What a heads-up play from Matt. Able to take the Tunic. That plus the resource floating is going to be able to send the Spider's Bite for one with Piercing. Like you said, the equipment block is not effective on either of those. And then the just the, the uh, end turn, but uh, full pass, as you might say and the four-card hand on Matt's side. And he's in the driver's seat now, sending Spider's Bite. Wow. Masterfully played from Matt. Masterfully played. He's just going to try to steal as many cards as he possibly can each turn. And each of these spider, or each of these uh, daggers, I should say, representing lethal win the game on hit. Even the blue isolate representing oh, on this hit might be win the, the game. The yellow death touch. But there it is. Is that the swap? He's going to swap in and... 
That's the yellow death wow. touch and the game. What and a would, game. Would you look at that? Managing what? that end game so masterfully and picking up the win is Matt on Azuri. I'll tell you what, I was not expecting that game to go that close down to the wire. I thought it would be uh, a bit more of like a big smashing at the end, but man, it got to the fatigue state. Like you said, it ve- very much felt like a guardian mirror back and forth into that uh, into that last few cards. Yeah, Matt played the end game masterfully. Uh, every block and every attack was well calculated. He knew his pitch deck just from the way he played with the daggers. It was a masterful, masterful play. Congratulations to him on Azuri for picking up the win. I believe he's now sitting at 2-0 and going into week number three. So we hope you enjoyed these two games. If you did, leave a comment down below. Tell us which one was your favorite. And uh, don't go too far because we got more coming down the pipeline. Thanks for watching, everybody. Hello and welcome back to Arclight League. This is week two. I'm Cast, joined by Josh Lau. We're going to be jumping into an awesome uh, warrior matchup. Of course, we got Josh here, the expert for it. And it's going to be Nathan Crawford on Dorinthia and Chris Ayali on Bolton. So let's go ahead and just jump straight on into that. And we'll start talking a bit about how this matchup goes down. A good old warrior mirror for the final game of the week here. Cass, I'm really, really excited about this. Uh, warrior mirrors tend to be extremely intricate and especially if they're not like straight mirrors we're, like Dory versus Dory Bolton versus right. Bolton uh, there's a lot of uh, th- this is like the complete test of the player's skill they have to know their deck they have to know their opponent's deck they have to know the card pool they have to understand when to attack when to defend how to use their armor the tunic tempo for uh, Chris is going to be very very important and you know Rolling the grains, vigor tokens is going to be important for Nathan. And uh, yeah, this is going to be, you know, a really, really, really good game. Yeah, and immediately this feels like a pretty rough uh, way to start for Chris, right? The commanding performance, being able to kind of uh, try and strong arm away into a Dawnblade counter because Bolton, a lot of his deck is attack actions. I mean, most of it, I I believe, are generally just going to be attack actions. So uh, being able to threaten that arsenal immediately and it's just going to be Chris already throwing some armor at it yeah that's that's actually surprising here um the the armor here is really really critical along with soul shield that's one of the best ways to shut down a turn without reprise uh but i guess uh chris uh is maybe valuing like uh maybe a v or something in arsenal more um 
one thing to note in this matchup is that Bolton is going to have to work very, very, very hard for go again. Cards like we see right here, Beaming Bravado, are really kind of help alleviate that. As long as you charge a yellow card, you get a get go again. You're going to be able to convert your soul into damage here. Um, but in general, obviously, uh, Dorinthia does not have uh, attack actions in the deck. And here we see uh, Illumina. Um, pretty good here. Going to pressure at least the armor here of Nathan here. But preferably, you need to get Spirit of Arena into play or have an attack reaction, as we there see we here. Go. That's very, very good here. Um, if your Luminas are not hitting as Bolton, uh, that means Ooh, you probably were too greedy. And we got a sink blow from Nathan to meet it at the perfect time here. And Chris is going to end his turn with uh, no soul, probably. Yeah, um, it's very, very likely. Like that. that might be the case here, right? Uh, you know, we saw Chris uh, able to use the take it on the chin to get the agility to start off this turn. So he's able to, you know, use that extra soul from the charge to keep this go again train rolling. But end of the day, yeah, it gets completely kind of stuffed here with that sink below, especially, mm -hmm. you know, following up, stopping that attack reaction. And now, mm -hmm. you know, Nathan's kind of got yep. pl plenty yeah, of defense there, stopped everything from Chris mm -hmm. and gets to just come back with a Dawnblade for six, threatening to go again. It's a really, yep. really nice uh, two card turn. Yep. Yeah, I, I, I'll be honest. I'll pr I would have preferred if Nathan had just swung a naked Dawnblade Arsenal, the Warriors Valor, because... Uh, with grains, you're threatening on hit get a vigor token mm. at the minimum. Um, That's true. We've we've already seen that uh, Chris likes to play Bolton a little bit more aggressively. I think this is like the third or fourth game I've seen from him. Um, and I do talk with Nathan; he's my teammate, so he, we he is aware of the tendencies of uh, <laughs> some warrior players. Uh, so uh, setting up cards in Arsenal is very very important for Dorothy for many reasons. Uh, Hiding information basically is uh, makes people overblock. It makes people have to react to things that may or may not be there. And we have Spirit of Arena yeah. now in play. That's 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 very very important here. That Chris found this in the first three turns. Yeah, Chris slowed it down a bit, started blocking a lot more, and it, it makes mm -hmm. a lot of sense, right? Get the Spirit online. You used one Lumina, but the other two can still come through, and it's such a powerful combination to get that additional go again, playing the non-attack action at instant mm -hmm. speed due to that Spirit. Yeah. I mean, it, it is like one of the most powerful things that Bolton does, and it's always terrifying once that Spirit hits the board. Yep. One of the most powerful things that you can do uh, with Bolton is V and then flash an Illumina. So normally that would break the combat chain and you would lose the buff from the V, but uh, with Spirit of Arena, that doesn't break the combat chain. So uh, really, really, uh, really, really important that he has this on the field here. Um, back to Nathan, though. He's got a five-card hand here. And how do you want to approach this? This is a... Uh... You're... you're... I, I think Nathan's starting to maybe smell blood here a little bit. Okay, so <laughs> nobody box a naked Don Blade. I hope this is Glint. I mean, it's got to be right. It, it's yeah. it's some some kind of yep. go again is coming here from yep. this. Uh, this I mean, mm -hmm. Bolters is blocked, right? Bolters can be the option. Yep, it could be. Uh, and it looks it's like Bolters. it is. A, so breaking Bolters above thirty life. Uh, this is uh this is uh, highly unconventional here, and I think, uh, okay, a goblet here playing out here, and Nathan's going to, I think Nathan's flooded with blues. Seems like it, it's yeah. Weird. It's, it, it's weird that he uh, pitched a hit and run when he could have pitched a twinning blade there. So this kind of tells me maybe he has like reprise cards in hand or something like that. We'll, we'll, we'll see here. Yeah, I mean, just dumping a ton of resources into, you know, equipment and everything mm -hmm. here, right? We we saw grains activated. Yep. We get an activation of the Bloodforged yep. Bracers. Bracers. I, I'm yep. Honestly, if this hits, I would expect maybe another grains activation to come through, considering yep. how this turn has gone so far. Mm -hmm. uh, and it looks like no blocks initially declared here. Counter comes through another grains. Is that three mm -hmm. vigor, one agility coming into this next turn? Yep. Yep, so Chris knows that there's a reprise card in arsenal and a reprise dependent card in arsenal reprise dependent card in hand so he might just be like i'm never blocking for the next four turns <laughs> yeah i guess it depends uh, how fast he can go too right if he can yeah. kind of respond with enough aggression you know you might as well right because it's yeah. essentially the point where nathan has to ip himself because he's stuck with this card in an arsenal at the very least mm-hmm 
and we're, we're we're seeing like a very very this is basically a game of chicken here uh dory's like i got a counter i'm not gonna block and then bolton's like well i'm gonna activate iron song versus and set up my next turn are you gonna block and he's like no i'm not blocking it's like all right you, you don't block that's fine i'm gonna be set up for next turn and dory's like well i'm set up for next turn too and uh th this game could go much much faster here at this point uh with a five card hand at minimum, you're going to be able to protect this Dawnblade counter, assuming that uh, Chris did not draw Soul Shield. Yeah. This there's, act there's actually a very important sideboarding note here that we need to talk about. So Bolton as Soul Shield, that's very very good. But he also has generally, if he is playing a switchboard, has access to Sink and Fate. But you may not want to play Sink Fate reinforce the line in Raiden because that makes your offense very clunky. And Dorinthia can pivot to fatigue if they notice you're playing too many defensive cards. Um, especially if you start having to block to get the Dawnblade counter off of uh, the Dawnblade. So uh, I've been watching uh, Chris's defensive suite. It looks like he's probably just on Soul Shield. Yeah, it seems to be the case. And now we see Chris just go for the arsenal, draw up, mm -hmm. as we do have an actual block there, trying to stop the Courage counter from... Showing up, it was a red puncture that blocked. I was actually yeah, thinking, that's... you know, considering having three yeah. uh vigor tokens, you would expect, like, oh, I don't need this blue, right? Throw a blue in, block with the equipment, and, and deny the counter because you have so many extra resources. But it was a red, so that might tell us a bit about what this hand looks like for Nathan. I would assume very red heavy. Yeah, th that makes that that's really an odd decision, I think, because if if we assume that Nathan still has a reprise dependent card in hand here. Uh, you would prefer to block with that unless it's like singing steel blade and he thinks that Chris is going to block here. However, uh, I, I feel like just Chris as a player does not like to block. <laughs> so, and this is, I, 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 it sounds like a joke, right? But no, like, no, but it's true. Like, We've seen it. As, as a Dorinthia player, these are the things, you poke your opponent in the first four turns to see how they react to different situations, and then you adapt, right? So if, if, if I notice Chris is not blocking that much, I mean, I, that means I don't need to set up five card hands. I value cards like Iron Song Response and Singing Steel Blade less. He used his armor really quickly. That means I value Puncture less. Um, so like cards like Blade Flurry, Warrior's Valor, and a blue, that three card hand is good enough to go on offense against Bolton here. Um, so Nathan really having to think here about this, uh, four card hand here. Yeah. I mean, he wants to keep this counter. It feels like, you know, there's not a lot of armor for Chris, as you mentioned, right? Yep. You use this very early. So keeping mm -hmm. a counter should be relatively easy considering the three resources already floating there is an agility, but of course, you know, with Dorinthia, you do have to get that first hit or you need a Twinning Blade. But isn't Twinning Blade a lot of times being run as a one-of nowadays? And we saw Nathan pitch that into the deck as well. Oh, and Bolton Ooh. Blade. Interesting. <laughs> Does not catch the okay. field, though. So that's what he was talking There was a lot of banter. In we, we I don't have the, the, the sound on, but there was a lot of back and forth banter there. And Nathan was like, I, I think you got a Soul Shield in Arsenal. <laughs> And Chris is like, maybe. <laughs> uh, yeah. What was your question? I got distracted by that. I'm Honestly, sorry. <laughs> I, I oh, it was it was about twenty blade. It was like you know, okay, you know, twenty blade is a one of go right? again here. Even though you have agility, yeah. mm -hmm. a lot of times twenty blade is a one of. So it, unless I, you can get the hit, mm -hmm. yeah, it, it, yeah. I, generally, twi in the past, twenty blade was run as a three of. I think currently, I, my, I personally am running two, um, mainly because I've cut glistening steel blade from my deck. Uh, so basically you just want the twinning blade as a tutor target and you want, you only need to break, to trick them with twinning blade once. Right. So, uh, and then here we go. All oh, the reprise okay. dependent cards coming out here. And this is going to be enough to break through as well. And what's so dangerous here is that Chris should have known that Nathan has a singing steel blade and this is early in the game. So he has access to tutoring anything basically. And we're, he, we're gonna see him tutor probably a probably another Iron Song response or Blade Flurry here because just that's how the resources line up here. Uh I think the Blade Flurry would be 
Let's see here. Let's cut. So there's three armor available for Chris plus a card in hand. So that's, you know, six or seven block here. And the blade flurry here would make the next attack go to eight, right? So that's playing around. Uh, uh, blade flurry basically plays around, you know, Chris dumping his whole hand plus all his armor. So he basically cannot block this. Yep, gonna get an additional yep. counter. I mean, eight is is way too high. So this is, I mean, this is an yep. insane spot for Nathan to be able to turn this corner and get a second counter onto the Dawn Blade. Yep. And uh, there's and, gonna be no response yeah. from Chris, right? He has to pass the turn. Yep. So now it's a four card hand, yep. two counter Dawn Blade. Yep. So Chris basically here, you ha he has to take a giant risk. He has to throw his whole hand down here and hope that Nathan does not have Iron Song Determination, Stinging Steel Blade, or Twitting Blade, uh, or you know, overpower or something like that. Uh, cause this, this is already at the point where if that's like red overpower or route in hand, uh, he's, he's in trouble here and he can't even present a full block here. Does he have a no block in hand? He's got to throw his whole hand oh, down here. Blint gets an extra card too. It's another look. This, this is playing with fire. Like you, two counters on Dawn blade plus supremacy. Yeah, there's the iron zone. And you, you don't throw your whole hand down here. You, th this is okay. It's a fate. Okay, he had a team right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Jesus. I know you were talking about right, how this, so... you know, likely you kind of didn't want to play this into yeah. uh with your oh, raiding man. build, but there's still a puncture. So even yeah. still with the D React, Nathan, Nathan did lead through. Drew the nuts there. Like he his glint drew him another attack reaction. Yeah. Yep, able to he find did one not more. naturally have that. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if you uh, found the puncture or the iron song, but it doesn't matter, right? If it, it found yeah, one it of doesn't the matter. two, found the pump, and then and, the draw off of supremacy gives you the pitch to swing again. And we, we saw Nathan pitch a commanding performance there. He's like, yeah, I'm just going to leave you stuck with a bolting blade in Arsenal. You, you, you can't win this game from here because, like, to get bolting blade out of the Arsenal has to keep a V and has to keep several cards. And that's not even that much damage. V into Bolting Blade into Raiden is only 595. And yeah. <laughs> there's, like, okay, we have a Glistening Steel Blade here. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah, with already having this many counters, I mean, this, is, it, it beco this card becomes even more absurd. The, this is the situation where you want to play Glistening, is when you have counters already, and no blocks from Chris. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, you gotta throw your whole hand down here and pray. That that's all you can do. You yeah. you can't give him another counter. You you don't race you don't race Dawn Blade once it has two counters. That's no, incorrect. I mean, in ninety nine percent of situations, we're at the point where even if you're you know playing the the biggest fridges imaginable, you can't yeah. just throw it in front and hope that it happens. Yep. And by not blocking the first attack, you're presented with the same problem. It's worse. Plus, he got to activate <laughs> grids. Yeah, it's worse. It's 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 real bad here. Uh, Nathan should not wager this. Chris should just throw his whole hand down here. But I, I, I don't even know what's going on here. Like, what could Chris even have to to be presenting I, here? The only thing that, like, if he was sabers, right? It's like, oh, he's got the whole combo to try and it, run back here. But the only the only conceivable thing I could see is if there's like a V and two Luminas in hand yeah. and a light card. Yeah, I mean, maybe sure, right. That, that would be it. that. That would literally be the only thing I would keep. Probably still not <laughs> even the that. One. To be honest. Show me V double Lumina. <laughs> Come on. Yeah, V single charge and flash of two Luminous, please. All right, there's the tunic. There's the V. Okay. Yep. All right. There's okay, double, he double carriage. charged. He double charged. Okay. okay double charged. So he has to get the bolting blade out and the Lumina out. This makes some sense if this is Lumina in hand, but <laughs> you're you're dead at one yeah. against a Dory <laughs> with six counters. Um, at least you'll make the life total a little closer here, but this was not a, this was not the path to victory here. And this this shows like if you defend incorrectly against Dory, she'll cut you up. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I mean you do do not want to be on the wrong end of the reprise getting caught. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And Nathan's like vanilla damage, sure. <laughs> Bolting blade, vanilla damage, sure. <laughs> So, 
you never block the V, you never block the bolting blade. You basically are waiting to see if the follow up is bolt of courage, snatch, or yeah, like bolt of courage. So, so not this even is going to get a block. Here. This is going to get a block here. Um, Nathan's going to take this opportunity to use his crown of providence here, almost certainly, to filter for the finest of Dory closing hands. Yeah, I mean, anything that's not the perfect card here is such an easy cop away. Yeah. Especially because just like covering the five, as you're saying, right, it, it, mm. it stops the turn to just be a Raiden at the end instead of anything yep. else. And you, you're like, okay, yep. well, I can take four more pretty easily. That's not a big deal. Or I guess it'd be five, right, with the double V. Yep. But still, yep. it, it doesn't, you know, hurt whatsoever. Mm. You just block this five, stop the draw, one card and cop, and you just get yep. to filter your hand to be even better to close the game with the, is that what, six Dawnblade counters? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, six Dawnblade counters is, is uh, getting up there here. Glistening Steel Blade and Crown of Providence here going to block. And that shows a lot of discipline for Nathan. Uh, you don't really need the Glistening with the Agility Token, but you basically never let Bolton draw on a V-turn. That's, that's just what you need to do. <laughs> and uh, Nathan here is going to drop to 13 almost certainly, and this four card hand, as long as it has some amount of a uh, uh, okay. <laughs> okay, that's what uh, sure on hit draw a card on hit you die. Oh, so yeah. we got a one cost sharpened steel that cost uh, yellow sharpened steel here, uh, and uh, you know swinging for casual eleven here. Throw your whole hand down here, get blown out by twinning blade. And that should be the game. Blow by twenty blade, iron song, or anything, any card. Man, there's so many. There's so many things right now. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Dory, and, uh, Dory, when she goes off, is always very fun to watch. Yep. But also, like on Chris's yep. side, it's like, okay, well, I guess I needed to drop a whole hand in front of one of these a little mm -hmm. earlier. Can't let it run away this far. Yep, blocking eight on eleven. Nathan's be like, sure, no reactions. Play your. Fate or soul, shield. soul yep. shield. Okay. Yep. Now, Ken Nathan with two cards and two resources pumping above. Oh, never mind. Don't need nope. to. <laughs> Gotta go around and a final thrust of Dawn Blade. Casual oh, he even 25. had Warrior's Valor. <laughs> he had Warrior's Valor to go with that. Oh, that's the game geez. there. Well, <laughs> good job, Nathan. I'm sure you're watching this. You get you get my approval. <laughs> I mean, what it, I, it's a, it's an insane game, right? Like the, it came to a point where Chris had no shot mm -hmm. anymore. I think the big kind yeah. of point where that happened was when there was the Dawn Blade that comes through. The D React pushes it to twelve, but mm -hmm. we had the Glint grab an extra reaction, Attack, right? and yeah. that just completely. I mean, the game was over at that point. Now maybe yep. you know maybe Chris could have tried to defend a little bit harder earlier on in the game, throw down a hand, try and slow down those Dawnblade counters. But I, I do think presenting twelve block there was a pretty reasonable expectation to be like, okay, I can probably stop this now. But nope, Nathan blows through it. I mean, I, what 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 an awesome game! I love to see yep. it. I mean, any any final thoughts on that game before we close out for the week? Uh, for for bolted players out there that are that are playing this matchup, you have to be very very selective with the hands that you attack with. Uh. If your tunic is not at three, you're generally not going on offense. And you have to play good defense against Dory just in general. Um and be willing to block more. Uh, I think uh if uh Chris had blocked a little bit more, we we would have saw that the tunic counter would come up naturally a little bit more. He'd have the life buffer to take a round of damage and strike back. And when if you're striking back with Bolton even presenting a couple on hits here and there that'll force the Dory to block and then it'll make the math easier on defense if they have a counter when they only have a two or three card hand so uh also he didn't see soul shield in the first couple turns so that means he has to slow the game down a little bit and soul shield is very important for you know turning the corner um so i would have liked to see him slow down the game a little bit um other than that i think i think it was a you know it was just 
it was Dory uh, get uh, high rolling a little bit, but uh, also being piloted very well. Yeah. So. By the time he got the soul shield, it was quite funny. He finally gets it, yeah. and then it's like, oh no, twinning blade. We're gonna go no. around this yeah. one. <laughs> try try yeah. again later. Uh, that, that's, yeah, a, that's a mega feels bad right there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's gonna be it for week two of the Arc Light League. I've been Cass. That's Josh Lau. Thank you all for watching, and we'll see you on the next one. Bye bye.